like Sesame Street, of these benevolent epidemics. He lists one religious movement, only one. Only one grew fast enough, fast enough that he felt like it should never have happened that way, but it did. And only one had this stickiness quality woven into it in a way that he felt uh, justified him putting in the book. And that one was us. Yeah, Methodism. He talks about as a benevolent epidemic. And he says the, the Methodist movement became epidemic in England and North America, taking from 20,000 to 80,000 followers in the U.S., in the space of five or six years in the 1780s. You know, I get pretty excited as a district superintendent if a church grows five or ten percent a year. <laughs> so this was not a church, but a denomination that doubled and then doubled again in five years. Yeah. Believe it or not, it, 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 it continued to grow for about 70 years. Not quite that fast, but unbelievably fast. Faster than any religious movement in the history of the world. That's who we are. So Gladwell looks at us and tries to understand how did this happen? It shouldn't have happened, right? But it did. It really did. And so what he discovers, now he's not a, he's not a religious writer, he's not a religious person, but um, he's studying us from the outside. And here's his kind of conclusion. Wesley's Methodism spread like wildfire through England and America because Wesley was shuttling back and forth among hundreds, and here's the key, Hundreds and hundreds of groups. And each group was then taking his message and making it even stickier. So what he says was that the genius of Methodism and Wesley was, was bringing people together in these little small groups. Now, by the way, if you were Methodist, for our first 150 years, you were in a small group. Because that's what it meant to be Methodist. You had to be a part of a band or a class meeting every week. And uh, that's what it meant to be Methodist. But... Um, where, where Gladwell says there's something that happened in these small groups that was incredibly sticky. Maybe the stickiest Christianity has ever been. And that's kind of as far as he goes. But we know what happened in those groups. In fact, the reason why we know is because Wesley um, gave a basically, essentially, a blueprint of what was to happen in every single class meeting. And what every leader was supposed to do. And the first order of business, and really the dominant order of business, was this. If you are a class meeting leader, every week, the whole group, to inquire how their souls prosper. Okay? Seems a pretty interesting question, right? So you'd sit down, and the leader would say, how has your soul prospered recently? And then you were invited to share in your own words. What lifted your spirit? Maybe even what lifted your spirit despite some thorn in your side. Or despite some calamity. If Paul had been a Methodist, I kind of think he was. <laughs> <laughs> he probably wouldn't have said it in the third person. He probably would have said, you know... 14 years ago, I was caught up, well, except if it happened, why did it happen? He'd say, last week or two weeks ago, I was caught up to the third heaven. I don't even know if it was in my body or not, but uh, God knows. And I was caught up to paradise, and I heard inexpressible things. Let me tell you, can you imagine sitting in a group and someone sharing that story? First of all, it takes a lot of courage to share that story. Why? Because people might say, I think Paul's been drinking too much, right? <laughs> or I think he's crazy. Or I think he's hallucinating, right? That's all the stuff that happens uh, when, when people share stories like this. Except, believe it or not, people don't really think that as much as we think they do. But I think what really would have happened would have been people would have said, wow, that's the stuff that I see in my life. And that's the type of stuff I want to be connected with. And maybe if that type of stuff is really the way life and faith works, two things. One, I might be open to that, and you know what? Maybe I'll even share when that has already happened. That's what happened in these small groups. People shared those sorts of stories. The word I like to use to talk about these stories is an epiphany. An epiphany, a divine human encounter. 
a religious experience, seeing beyond the veil. And by the way, it's one of the stickiest and most transformational experiences in life. It was so transformational, Paul throughout his life went back to that, to that reference. You know, probably year three and year five, five years ago and eight years ago, he constantly told that story because it, was, it stuck to him. It transformed him. Epiphanies uh, are part of our faith. We have a season called Epiphany because it's one of the strands of Christianity. It's always been a part of who we are. There are some people that have had epiphanies. Actually, I think there are lots of people that had epiphanies. But there's some people that had epiphanies and were willing, like Paul, to write about them. And I call them epiphany people. Some call them mystics or contemplatives. And I'm going to list 16 of them. I want you to... I'm going to read the names, look at the list, and uh, these are my uh, epiphany people. These are the people that have just deeply spoken to me. I resonate with them. Maybe a quote that I saw from them, or a story that I read that they wrote. <clears throat> Hildegard of Bingen, St. Francis of Assisi, Meister Eckhart, Emmanuel Swedenborg, Juliana Norwich, Teresa of Avila, Martin Luther, Blaise Pascal, John Wesley, yeah. My heart was strangely warm. Yeah, there's <laughs> George Fox, John Muir, Teilhard de Chardin, Agnes Sanford, Thomas Merton, John Wimber, Henry Now. Now what I want you to do is look at, look at the first list again. And I want you to, to note if there's anybody on that list that somewhere in the course of your life you've come upon some word that they wrote or a quotation or maybe even know a little bit more and it, and it, and it has spoken to you deeply. So look at that list and that list. And if there's one or more persons that you resonate with, I want you to raise your hand right now. Okay, look around the room, okay? The majority of us have our hands up, right? And, uh, and, and it wasn't hard because usually they affect us deeply. 